Hello, everyone from um, WHO headquarters here in Geneva. Welcome to a regular press conference uh, regarding the situation with COVID-19. Uh, today, uh, we will have a special guests, as we have announced in the media advisory, and Dr. Tedros will uh, introduce them. We also have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff and Dr. Mike Ryan. We have, a, uh, as we had in the previous days, uh, simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages plus Portuguese and I will thank the interpreters who are here with us. Uh, also, we have sent you a number of uh, press releases today, uh, so hope you got those, and some of them are about the topics that we will hear about today. So before we go to questions, Dr. Tedros will have a remarks, and he will also introduce our guests. Uh, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Three months ago, I convened the emergency committee under the international health regulations. And after receiving their advice, I declared a global health emergency, WHO's highest level of alarm on January 30th. And yesterday, I reconvened the emergency committee to review the evolution of the pandemic and advise me accordingly. After three months, the committee consists of independent international experts representing all regions and full range of relevant expertise. I would like to thank the chair of the committee, Professor Didier Husong and all the committee members. Of course, the pandemic remains a public health emergency of international concern. The committee has made several recommendations for WHO and for countries. To outline those recommendations, I would now like to invite Professor Usong to say a few words. Professor, you have the floor. The International Health Regulations, the Emergency uh, Committee uh, met uh, yesterday, uh, three months after the declaration of, uh, of a fake by the DG of WHO. Uh, first, let me thank also the, the members of the EC, which met yesterday during uh, six hours. They listened first to the analysis of the situation by the emergency directors of the six regions of WHO and by the Secretariat, which has a global view of the, the situation. Clearly, a huge amount of work has been, has been done at WHO at all levels and by member states to try to face this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, clearly, also, there are differences, differences between regions. In some regions, the impact of the disease is very severe. In some others, it is less severe. Many things have been accomplished, but challenges are still present and challenges are huge. After three months, the EC members were first asked to uh, state whether this terrible event is still a public health emergency of international concern. And as you said, Dr. Tedros, the answer was quite simple. It is clear, the advice to the DG was clear. Yes, COVID-19 is still a public health emergency of international concern. COVID-19 pandemic is not finished. EC members were then asked to study uh, advices formulated in January. Uh, should these recommendations be abandoned? Should they be modified? Should they be completed? And two categories of advices were uh, issued by the, the committee, which I would like to very briefly not review, but just to identify some of the most important ones. More than 20 recommendations were addressed to WHO, and I would like to focus on four of them. The increased efforts towards fragile states and vulnerable countries, and to mitigate possible disruption 
of food supply in some countries, interruption of travel, of air travel in some cases, uh, is a big handicap to cargo transportation. And this is why this is a risk which needs to be uh, addressed. Second, to develop strategic guidance with partners for a safe return to normal operation of passenger travel. This is a difficult issue because it's a question of confidence between member states. It's a question of safe travel, but it's also a very important aspect for the activities in many countries which are uh, relying very much on air travel. The third one is to revise recommendations on appropriate travel measures and to analyze their effect on COVID-19 transmission with consideration, this is a very important point, to the balance between benefit and unintended consequences. Then we addressed also a series of recommendations, also more than 20, to the member states. And I would like to focus very briefly on three of them. First, to support WHO leadership. We have only one WHO and we are in the middle of a pandemic. Second, to work with WHO and multi-sectoral partners to interrupt virus transmission using all the techniques and methods which can be used, considering, of course, the unintended consequences which can arise in some circumstances. And finally, I think it's very important to address the knowledge gaps with regard to research. We know too little about the transmission of the virus. We have at the moment nothing for prevention with vaccine, and we have at the moment no licensed therapeutics. This should change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Didier Houssin, for these uh, remarks. Uh, I will give the floor again to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Houssin. Uh, I would like to make a few remarks about the committee's advice for WHO. We appreciate the confidence and trust expressed by the committee in WHO to continue to lead and coordinate the global response to the pandemic in collaboration with countries and partners. We're committed to fulfilling that role and to accelerating our efforts. WHO will continue supporting all countries with technical and logistical support, especially those that need it most. We accept the committee's advice that WHO works to identify the animal source of the virus through international scientific and collaborative missions in collaboration with the World Organization for Animal Health and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. We will continue supporting countries to sustain essential health services, including vaccination, care for women during pregnancy and childbirth, and care for non-communicable diseases, including mental health conditions. As we have done clearly from the beginning, we will continue to call on countries to implement a comprehensive package of measures to find, isolate, test, and treat every case and trace every contact. We will continue working with countries and partners to enable essential travel needed for pandemic response, humanitarian relief and cargo operations, and for countries to gradually resume normal passenger travel. As Professor Usong explained, the committee has also made recommendations for countries, and we encourage countries to pay careful attention to that advice, and we encourage countries to follow WHO's advice, which we are constantly reviewing and updating as we learn more about the virus, and as we learn more from countries about best practices for responding to it. In accordance with the International Health 
regulations. I will reconvene the emergency committee again in 90 days or sooner if needed. As you remember, last Friday we joined the European Commission and other partners to launch the ACT Accelerator to ensure all people enjoy access to all the tools to prevent, detect, and treat COVID-19. This coming Monday, May 4, the Commission will host a pledging conference to generate funds for investment in vaccine research. I hope you have heard the call from the President of the European Commission, Dr. Ur President Ursula von der Leyen. Today, we're deepening our relationship with the European Union by signing a new memorandum of understanding with the European Investment Bank, AIB. This agreement covers five main areas of work. First, WHO and European Investment Bank will collaborate on a new European Union malaria fund to address market failures in developing more effective vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics for malaria. Also, malaria deaths have fallen by more than half since the year 2000. Progress has stalled in recent years and may even reverse if the COVID-19 pandemic disrupts malaria control programs. Last year, WHO Strategic Advisory Group on Malaria Eradication and the Lancet Commission on Malaria Eradication both concluded that we will need new tools if we are to achieve the dream of eradicating malaria. Both reports called for increased investment in research and development to deliver new tools. With WHO's technical expertise and the European Investment Bank's financial muscle, we're confident of accelerating the development of those new tools. Second, our two organizations will work together to foster the development of new innovative antibacterial treatments. Antibiotic resistance is one of the most urgent health challenges of our time. It threatens to unravel a century of medical progress and leave us defenseless against infections that were previously easily treated. Investment in antibiotic development has continued to decline. Some small antibiotic companies went bankrupt in 2019 because of the limited profitability of the new antibiotics. Very few new antibiotics are in the pipeline. Most of them offer little benefit over existing treatments, and very few target the most critical resistant bacteria. To address this challenge, WHO and the European Investment Bank are working on a fund to invest in the development of new antibiotics for priority pathogens. WHO and EIB now are in discussions with potential investors and other stakeholders on this initiative. Third, we will work together to strengthen primary health care and build resilient health systems. The COVID-19 crisis has illustrated that even the most sophisticated health systems have struggled to cope with the pandemic. WHO has grave concerns about the potential impact the virus could have as it starts to accelerate in countries with weaker health systems. With the EIB, we will therefore work urgently to invest in health infrastructure and health workers in 10 countries in Africa and the Middle East to start with. Fourth, EIB and WHO are exploring how the European Investment Bank could support the COVID-19 supply chain system. 
to facilitate the distribution of diagnostics, personal protective equipment, and other medical supplies to countries that need them most. And fifth, we will work together to study market failures in other areas of public health to examine how innovative financing could help overcome investment barriers and increase access to life-saving products and services. The EIB has rich experience in innovative financing. I learned from my friend Werner Hoe today that the EIB were pioneers of the so-called green bonds 30 years ago to generate funds for climate and environmental projects, billions of dollars. We look forward to seeing how that type of innovative financing could deliver real results for global health when WHO is advocating health for all. As you know, we have been saying all roads should lead to universal health coverage. And it's not actually more important than now ever during COVID pandemics to say exactly the same. All roads should lead to universal health coverage, health for all. WHO is deeply grateful to the European Investment Bank for its support and collaboration. I would now like to invite the President of the European Investment Bank, Mr. Werner Hoe, to say a few words. Vielen Dank, my friend, and you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Tedros. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you today. Uh, around the world, the COVID-19 pandemic is leaving a global trail of health, social, and economic destruction that is unprecedented in peacetime uh, since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So the coronavirus pandemic has exposed weaknesses in many health and economic systems and it has also shown vulnerabilities in the global community's ability to prevent and respond to pandemic threats. Facing such a global challenge, the response needs to be coordinated, it needs to be bold, it needs to be quick, and it needs to be reactive to a changing environment. I would like to thank WHO and Dr. Tedros in particular for their leadership and for their tireless efforts. As the EU Bank, we are fully committed to strengthening the European Union's global response. And as the largest multilateral investment bank in the world by assets, we believe that we have a responsibility to act and can play an important role in the global response. Cooperation with WHO is formalized today with the signature of this agreement. But our teams have been working on the ground together and learning from each other, implementing health projects for some time now. Indeed, in recent years, the EU Bank has provided more than $2.3 billion annually for healthcare and life science investments across Europe and the world. Since the pandemic was declared, the European Investment Bank has transformed its support for health and business investment to help tackle new challenges. European heads of State and government have recently called on the EIB to support 200 billion of new financing for the European economy as part of the joint EU response. Outside the European Union, we have committed to provide one third of the EU response, that is 5.2 billion for COVID-19 related health and business investment needs following discussions with partner countries, partners across 100 countries. On Monday afternoon, as the Tedas already mentioned it, we will together participate in the pledge conference bringing together the European Union, G20, and UN partners to step up research, uh, investment in vaccine research. As part of the pledge conference, I will outline how the EIB is currently assessing more than 20 vaccine development, diagnostic, and treatment projects, which could provide up to 700 million of euros of new investment. So, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues and I are pleased that today the EIB can step up our long-standing cooperation with the World Health Organization at this time of need. 
and it fits perfectly into our cooperation with the United Nations organization in general and its sub-organizations. Our new partnership combines the WHO's unparalleled global health expertise and the EIB's financial strength and creativity. It will help deploy innovative financing solutions for high-impact health investment and successful life science research and development. And this is exactly the international coordination needed to handle global health challenges. It comes at a time of need, but we look at the long longer term and at a wide spectrum of activities and projects. As confirmed by Dr. Tedros, this new agreement will allow the EIB and the WHO to support the up to 250 million euro EU malaria fund, where we cooperate so closely also with the European Union, represented by the Commission and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It will bring together public and private partners to develop and to deliver more active malaria treatment at a time when ongoing research efforts are threatened by COVID-19. The EU Bank has a successful track record of overcoming investment gaps across priority sectors. Market failures continue to prevent improvement of health globally. The EIB addresses these failures by crowding in and mobilizing finance to projects responding to societal needs. I think this is the key issue. We need to mobilize also private sector financing in order to reach our objectives. When we, Dr. Theodore has just referred to it, invented the green bonds 13 years ago as the first issue of green bonds, uh, the bank was considered lunatic. Now this market is more than $900 billion heavy, and it's a big success. And in my talks with the Secretary General of the United Nations, I promised that we would explore these possibilities, which we have explored with green bonds, also for other sustainable development goals, health and education being one of the key sectors there. Together with WHO, the EIB will not only accelerate investment in national public health systems, but also focus support of addressing antimicrobial resistance alongside malaria. It is essential that new investment successfully addresses the risk that current antimicrobial treatment will no longer be effective. We estimate that at least 1 billion euros is needed to provide medium-term solutions to antimicrobial resistance. Today's agreement will enable the EU Bank, the WHO, and new partners to accelerate work on a financing initiative, the new one. This will devel support development of novel antimicrobials and address the investment gap. And we are seeing on a daily basis investment to strengthen resilience to pandemics and public health emergencies. And this is essential to save lives and protect economic activity. So we will be able to support vulnerable countries around the world, which are facing huge pressures on limited health infrastructure and enable them to better tackle the impact of COVID-19. In the coming weeks, the EIB and WHO, alongside other UN partners, will strengthen public health preparedness by supporting new health investment, starting with 10 countries across Africa. Indeed, as part of Team Europe, we have committed to supporting 1.4 billion euros to new COVID-19 financing in sub-Saharan Africa. Our combined efforts in the coming months and years will strengthen the value of the work of the UN supply chain systems, improving the provision of equipment, will accelerate investment in primary health care and pandemic preparedness. This will increasing, include increasing investment in health workers and improving water and sanitation infrastructure. And together as an international community, we need to step up investments in global health and resilience. I, believe the aforementioned is an important step. Let me thank all those involved in making today's agreement with the WHO possible. Dr. Tedros, thanks to you and your collaborators on this great initiative. Uh, I know that there are much more important issues to discuss today, as we have just heard, but if there are any questions uh, on our activities, I'm ready to respond. Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Hoyer, for your remarks, and uh, thank you also for agreeing uh, to stay with us for uh, possible questions that may come from, from journalists. Uh, Dr. Tedros will now formalize this agreement by signing the Memorandum of Understanding between the World Health Organization and European Investment Bank. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, um, my friend uh, Werner. 
and I have uh, the MOU with me. So Mr. Hoye had already signed, so uh, it's an honor for me to sign. Thank you. So that's it, signed. And thank you so much to the European Investment Bank for its support, and especially to my friend, Mr. Werner Foye. Thank you so much. Together, we will thank find- Thank you so much. We will, thank you, thank you. Feel and We'll get it done. And uh, now we will open the floor uh, for questions from journalists. I will remind everyone to be very short and have only one question if possible, as we have uh, simultaneous interpretation uh, in uh, six UN languages, Russian, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and also Portuguese. Uh, journalists may ask uh, questions in the language they prefer. So we will open the floor and we will start with Sarah Wheaton from Politico. Sarah, if you can just uh, indicate for whom your question is. Yes, this is Sarah Wheaton with Politico Europe. My question is for Mr. Hoyer. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for um, participating. Um, my, my question is, we, we are talking about the uh, event on Monday that is focused on equitable access. Last, likewise, the event last week was focused on equitable access. Um, the EIB is currently in negotiations with CureVac right now about the terms of the equity investment that, that the board approved. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, what, if any, um, requirements the EIB will insist on as far as terms to ensure equal access for CureVac's vaccine if it does turn out to be successful? Will you insist on things like uh, making the, the IP available, things like making sure the price is accessible? Um, and I did also just want to clarify the money for um, health systems in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that in the form of a, of a loan that will need to be paid back or is that a different type of, of financing? Thank you. On the latter question, uh, to be quite blunt, uh, EIB is a bank, and the the statutes of the bank uh, exclude the granting of of subsidies. So indeed, it's a loan. But the big advantage of this institution of this EU bank is, as a treaty-based institution of the European Union, we can cooperate closely with the European Union, represented by the Commission, and combine grants given by the European Union with loans given by us. We call this blending. And I think it is key to see that the, the business model of the bank always consists of combining lending, which is a normal activity for a bank, blending, that's what the European Union can put into it by the Commission, and thirdly, not least, last but not least, also advising. We need for these activities lots of advisory capacity, and I think uh, there, the cooperation between WHO and EIB is particularly uh, relevant. So, uh, on, on, on CureVac, I don't want and cannot go into the details because CureVac is not the only partner with which we negotiate. But since we are bound by public policy objectives, we of course look at the issues that you have indicated. That it goes without saying, uh, because um, we have to provide level playing fields and we have to provide equal access. There is no doubt about that. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoyer, uh, and hope this answers the question from Sarah Wheaton from Politico. Uh, now we will go to uh, Uganda, to Pamela Mawanda from Uganda Radio Network. Uh, Pamela, please unmute yourself and, uh, and ask the question. Hello? Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Tedros. Uh, following the um, emergency committee sitting, uh, what is your general advice to countries around the world in regards to how they should handle lockdowns, lifting of lockdowns, and the way forward to handling the virus? Sorry. Uh, 
difficulty finding the right button. Um, yeah, no, this is a this is a challenge that uh, governments uh, all around the world are, are facing right now. Um, and as you know, governments have implemented different forms of uh, public health and social measures, which many people know as as lockdowns. So it's very difficult to give specific advice uh, at a global level that is relevant to any individual country. What we've been uh, what we clearly recognise is that public health and social measures have been effective in suppressing uh, the intense transmission of the virus in many countries. And that's been achieved by different forms of lockdown in different countries. Uh, exiting uh, from there uh, requires a very careful, well-planned process that's based on, number one, understanding the exact epidemiology of the disease in, in your country or in in, in at sub-national level. So do you understand the problem? Do you understand where the virus is? Uh, on the basis of that, is the virus coming under control? Are you seeing a falling rate of infections? Uh, do you have in place uh, public health surveillance measures to identify, test, uh, trace and isolate? Uh, do you have, uh, uh, do communities have the necessary information uh, to protect themselves and do they have the necessary means to protect themselves through physical distancing, hand washing, etc. Uh, and has the health service been strengthened to a point where it can treat all of the cases effectively and protect health workers with adequate PPE. So they're the, the types of considerations that countries need to make. Uh, then obviously countries need to consider in the process of opening up their societies and their economies which measures to, to change or relax first, and, and how to measure the impact of those changes. Uh, and what we hope, obviously, to see is that the reproductive number or, the, or not uh, of the epidemic in any individual country will not jump up uh, because of easing of certain measures. So it's really important as countries um, ease those measures that they're constantly on the lookout for a jump in infections and in particular are dealing with transmission in, in special settings. And we've seen this in many countries. In, in Europe and North America, we've seen uh, the disease in long-term care facilities. In places like Singapore, the disease in, in, in dormitories for, for migrant workers. So what we need to be able to do is understand that even if the disease is under control um, in the general population, there may be vulnerable populations or contexts in which the disease can take off again, spread, uh, cause death, and potentially transmit back into the gen general community. So what we are advising is that countries take this measured, uh, stepwise approach uh, to the process and be ready, if necessary, to put back in place some of those public health and social measures if needed, um, should the, the disease jump back up. Uh, I, know, I know that is not, uh, it's, we, we do recognise, and I think all governments recognise, the, the difficulty of maintaining lockdowns for social, psychological and economic reasons. Uh, this is not easy. And we also recognise that in particularly in, in developing countries, where um, the, the immediate in economic impacts on contract workers and those who work from day to day for their, for their, for their daily bread uh, is even more profound. So uh, we, we are very anxious that we can move uh, to a situation where the disease can be kept under control with less severe measures, but at the same time we want to avoid a situation where we release measures too easily and then we bounce back into intense transmission and we have to do it all over again. These are very, very difficult judgments for governments to make, uh, but they must be done carefully um, and with eyes wide open. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. hope this answers a question uh, that came from uh, Pamela from Uganda Network of Radios. Uh, next question is from National Geographic, uh, uh, Sikan Akban. If you can hear us, uh, Mr. Akban, please ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you for taking my question, um, and it is for anyone willing to answer. Given what we know now about how the disease spread rapidly from China, does the Emergency Committee have any regrets over declining to declare a global health emergency during its first meetings on January 22nd and January 23rd? 
And if you could make the decision again, would you make a different one? Um, sorry. Uh, maybe I can just clarify that the, uh, the emergency committee does not uh, make such a declaration. It offers uh, advice to the director, that director general on, on making uh, such a declaration. Um, I, I think the DG has spoken about, about this before. The, the committee met and deliberated um, on those uh, at that first meeting and in fact extended its deliberations in, into the next day um, and uh, did not reach a consensus and was uh, very much not a consensus uh, around whether the event constituted a global public health emergency at that point. Uh, the committee did though ask that WHO collect more information uh, and seek to clarify um, the, that situation and be able to come back and provide more input with affected member states in order for them to be able to reach a determination and advise the DG accordingly. And as, uh, as you know, in that subsequent uh, week, much more investigation was done uh, in affected countries. We, we saw uh, um, uh, uh, also a, a mission to, to China led by the, the Director General himself uh, and uh, immediately on return from China, he convened uh, the committee again. Uh, and we presented, as well as countries presented, uh, further data to the committee. And at that point, the committee uh, uh, assessed that a global public health emergency existed and advised the DG accordingly. And he subsequently declared that same day. Thank you. Um, that's a very important question, so I would like to add to what um, Mike said. Uh, as Mike said, on the meetings of the emergency committee, the last meeting was on January 22, and then followed by January 23. And in both days, uh, they have discussed about whether to declare emergency or not. Uh, but they were divided. And as you also know, emergency committee is not like a parliament. So if they're divided, they don't go into votes, but they uh, actually propose to collect more information and more evidence, and then come back and see if they can reach a consensus. And a committee that advises uh, science and evidence-based organization should make sure that the right information and evidence is collected to reach a consensus on the recommendations they make to WHO or to me as, as DG. So that's why during their meetings on January 22 and 23, since they were divided because of lack of information, they had proposed to me to meet again after a few days to collect information, and they didn't recommend global emergency on January 23. Then after a few days, uh, they got information and evidence and they came back, I reconvened again on January 30, and they were then very confident because of the information they collected, and when they decided the global emergency on January 30, uh, they had a consensus to recommend that to me. And this was based on science and uh, evidence. And during that time on January 30, the number of cases we had outside China were only 82 cases, and there was no death. So meaning, I repeat again, the world had enough time to intervene. And I can say it again, me and my colleagues believe that, and the emergency committee, this public health emergency, the global emergency on January 30, was actually declared 
in a timely fashion that allows enough time for the rest of the world to respond because we only had 82 cases and no deaths. I repeat, 82 cases and no deaths. To declare global emergency in that situation, I think it says it all. It says it all. And anything between 22 and 30 years January was to collect information. And then the other thing I would like to say is, even between 22 January or 23 January and 30 January, we didn't waste any time, we didn't want to waste any time. And as Mike said, we had to move immediately, travel to Beijing immediately to discuss with the leadership and to find, to see for ourselves the situation in China. I remember then people telling us, advising us not to travel to China because this virus is new, you don't know how it behaves, you're putting your life at risk. And we said, no, we go because there are people who are putting themselves at risk in China and elsewhere. So our life is not different from them. We're actually the responsible guys to fight the virus and other outbreaks. So we should put ourselves first, actually, and we will go. The virus is unknown, but we're not afraid of the virus. We will go and check, even if it's putting ourselves at risk. That was when there were many unknowns of the virus traveling to the country where the outbreak was raging. But it's not just a travel to China, which should be considered as a big deal, because as you know, when Ebola was raging in DRC with my colleagues, we have traveled, myself included, in one year, 14 times. It's almost once a month. Because we need to be on the ground to see for ourselves. And that's what we did within the two meetings between 23 January and 30 January. No time was wasted to see for ourselves, even exposing ourselves to a virus which we don't know how it behaves. And that's what we do, not only for corona, but Ebola. And Ebola in DRC, not just exposing ourselves to Ebola 14 times, but exposing ourselves to the bullets in Eastern DRC, because there is a security problem in Eastern DRC, in North Kivu. But that's WHO's job. That's why we say we're proud to be, w, uh, to be WHO, because we always put our lives on the line to save lives. And that's why I'm proud to be WHO and to join all, our, all my colleagues, because they put their lives on the line every single day. We lost people in the RC. They gave their lives while saving others. And even recently, we lost our colleague in Myanmar collecting a sample for COVID, and he was killed. So that was what we did within the five days we had. That's the time when we also agreed with China to send the international experts to go and assist China to check for themselves, which was a groundbreaking negotiation and agreement that China agreed. And the experts were from many countries like Japan, South Korea, the United States, Singapore, Russia, Nigeria, and others. They opened up to, to be 
to work with international experts. And that's what we did between 23 January and 30th January. And I repeat, the 30th January was a timely declaration of the highest level of global emergency based on the International Health Regulation, which is WHO's mandate. Thank you very much. If uh, maybe Professor Usan would like to add something to this, the chair of the uh, emergency committee. I think that Dr. Tedros uh, explained very clearly the, the situation and the situation in which the emergency committee was on the 22nd and 23rd. That is, uh, on the 22nd and 23rd, there were four cases abroad, of course, with no death. And of course, uh, in French, we call it lucidité a posteriori. Lucidité a posteriori is an easy task, but uh, it's more uh, difficult to look forward and to anticipate what will happen uh, exactly. So uh, I think that, uh, the, as said Dr. Tedros, the declaration of a fake was uh, taken at the right time. You remember that sometimes WHO is accused of being too early, like in 2009 for H1N1, too late, like for Ebola. I think in this case, uh, WHO uh, decided in a timely, timely manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Husson, the chair of the uh, Emergency Committee Group of Independent Experts. Uh, just to let you know that we have just sent the, the statement of the Emergency Committee, so you should have it in your, in your inbox. We will go to the next question. That's uh, Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexican News Agency. Gabriela. Uh, Gabriela, can you hear us? You need to... Hola, hola. Hola. ¿Me escuchan? Can you hear me now? Good. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's a pleasure to be able to speak in Spanish. Our concern is that in Mexico, the the death rate is of 9.4 in Mexico. It's much higher than in the United States, for instance. So I'd like to know what you know about the situation in Mexico and um, what's being done in terms of the lockdown and that there aren't tests being carried out. There haven't been very many tests carried out, as you recommend. So what risks are there of just following one strategy? In other words, if you had to choose between a lockdown and public health measures, including testing, testing, and testing, which one would you choose? So I can start, and, and perhaps uh, Mike or Gigi would like to supplement. So um, you had a couple questions in there. The first one about uh, mortality. Um, I think we, we've spent a little bit of time of, of trying to describe the difficulties in, in estimating mortality as events unfold. Um, there's quite some variation in mortality by country if you actually look at how many, if it's defined as how many deaths are reported among the cases that are reported. Um, and there's challenges with that. One is um, depending on the testing strategy uh, and how much testing is being done, um, we, you may be missing cases that are on the more mild end of the spectrum, um, and so that's important to, to understand. Um, in terms of mortality and capturing deaths, uh, many countries right now are struggling um, to capture the deaths that are occurring from COVID-19. Um, there's a very good example across Europe um, through the Euromomo project, which is capturing excess mortality in many countries across Europe. And excess mortality right now is, is very high. Um, and so I think it will take some time for us to really understand um, which deaths are due to COVID-19 directly in terms of the infection causing that death and which of the deaths are associated with COVID-19, either because um, someone has died because they didn't get care uh, for some other reason. And I think it's going to take some time. So it's, we have to be careful when we compare mortality from Mexico versus mortality from the United States versus mortality even within a country. 
Um, and so there are some challenges there. Your other question about whether we do testing or whether we do public health measures, that's not the right question, unfortunately. It has to be all of these measures together. It has to be. Um, testing alone does not work. Um, contact tracing alone does not work. Lockdowns alone do not work. Um, it has to be part of a comprehensive strategy. Testing needs to be strategic. It can't be testing every single person in the population. It's just not feasible. It's just not possible. Um, we have tried to be very clear in our testing strategy and prioritizing your tests for suspect cases, testing suspect cases and contacts who develop symptoms. That's the priority. In situations where testing may become challenging because the tests aren't available or the reagents aren't available or the swabs are not available, then you need to be more strategic, even more strategic, and maybe focus on those individuals who may develop severe, severe disease and require care. Maybe focusing on more intensively on healthcare workers. And so um, it's a much long-winded answer because it's complicated. It depends on the situation that you're in, um, but it has to be a series of measures that are put in place. It cannot be one uh, situation, one um, measure alone. The DG has said not testing alone, not contact tracing alone, not isolation alone, not quarantine alone, not lockdown alone, all of these measures. Physical distancing is important. Hand hygiene is important. Respiratory etiquette is always important. Um, so it's all of these measures that need to be considered when either intensifying them or lifting them. <clears throat> just, just open very quickly, and um, from the perspective of um, the situation in, in Mexico, there have been uh, 16,752 cases in Mexico as of yesterday, with 1,569 deaths. Uh, but the number of cases is up 76 percent on the on by week on week, and up 80. The number of deaths is up 83 percent. So there's no question that in the case of Mexico, this is still a very active epidemic in Mexico. I don't have at hand, obviously, the subnational data, so I won't speak to the different patterns that may be occurring at the state level. Uh, if when you calculate a crude case fatality of those confirmed cases and deaths, you, you know, the, the, that case fatality is of the order of uh, 9%. Um, and th that, that can mean a number of things, but what, what it usually means at this stage in an epidemic is that there's uh, under-detection of the milder cases. That's what we see in many situations, a higher case fatality, and then as you test more people and you detect more mild cases, that, that proportion drops over time. Uh, it can also reflect and has reflected, as you've seen around the world, that when the health system comes under pressure and intensive care beds come under pressure, patient outcomes can be affected by the lack of oxygen or the lack of availability of ventilators, etc. So I would uh, say that uh, Mexico uh, uh, is, is, is like many countries in Central and South America, is, is um, on an increasing trend. Uh, more needs to be done in terms of surveillance, uh, testing, and, and obviously uh, the, our, American, uh, our, our regional office for the Americas, the Pan American Health Organization, is working very closely with authorities of Mexico to support them in improving surveillance and improving patient outcomes. And I know that, that Mexico has uh, at least nine registered uh, trials uh, for um, clinical trials and is also has uh, 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 shown interest or has requested to be part of our solidarity trials. So we thank Mexico for that. We thank Mexico for its openness and uh, data sharing, uh, and we will do all that we can at WHO and at PAHO to support their response because uh, right now the situation in Mexico is still evolving, still developing, and, and obviously more needs to be done to bring the disease under control. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banker Corbin, Dr. Ryan. Uh, next question is uh, coming from uh, Malaysia, Randy. Uh, Randy, can you hear us? You would need to unmute yourself. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Um, thank yes. you for taking my question. Um, I'm Blendy from The Telegraph. Uh, my question goes to the WHO in Geneva. So I'd like to ask you a question with regard to the spread of the virus in prisons and mental health institutions in Indonesia, the Philippines, and basically the rest of Southeast Asia. So 
Um, how worrying is this situation in the region in general, do you think? And what do governments in the region have to do more to tackle this crisis that might be taking place in, in those facilities? Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, thanks for the question. I don't have uh, specific numbers on, on the impact in prisons or mental health institutions in, in countries in Southeast Asia, but it's something we've issued guidance on in, in, in both cases. Uh, it's a concern. Uh, we've said the same about long-term care facilities in Europe, uh, dormitories for, for migrants in, in many countries in, 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 in the Middle East, in South Africa, in, in Singapore, uh, prisons all over the world. Uh, we've talked about cruise ships and other types of vessels. We've We've talked uh, about um, any long-term care facilities. And, and the reason why we've spoken and we've been so concerned about these facilities uh, for two reasons. One is that if a disease gets into a closed community, the disease uh, can spread very quickly. In fact, one of the most successful uh, programs for doing sentinel surveillance for influenza over the last 30 or 40 years was using boarding schools to, to, to check for the, for the disease because once influenza arrived in a boarding school it spread like wildfire so you could pick up a signal of the arrival of influenza in a country by these uh, groupings of people who amplified the disease. They almost became like amplifiers. So anywhere where people come together a respiratory uh, illness will spread quickly. Um, th that, that's always a difficulty and a problem. Uh, if it's a young, healthy community that are infected, then obviously the impact on them may be, may be less, but at, at the same time could be significant. When that disease gets into an institution or a facility in which there are many vulnerable people, be it people with underlying conditions, older populations, then the impact of the disease, not just the transmission, is great. Um, and I've said this before at these press sessions, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're in prison, it doesn't matter what your crime is, uh, all citizens and all people in society uh, deserve to be protected under the law, and, and as such, there are responsibilities uh, for all those who manage facilities to, number one, try and shield those facilities from disease getting in, having the necessary uh, measures in place to reduce the chance that disease will spread, and that means having the capacity to detect very quickly. And I think one of the thing in the things in an institution uh, that needs to be done really, really quickly is the first signal, the very first signal that something is wrong. You need to uh, react very quickly. You need to be able to remove any individual that's suspected of being a case very quickly from that grouping and you need to test uh, because a spark in a situation like that turns into a fire very, very quickly. Now, implementing those types of measures, hygiene measures, surveillance measures, um, and uh, physical distancing measures is a very constrained, uh, it, 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 it's a very constrained issue uh, because prisons have a limited size. Some countries have dealt with that by releasing uh, prisoners for non-violent crimes or prisoners towards the end of their sentences. Um, that, that can be done. Uh, Authorities in Singapore are working very hard to improve hygiene and, and, and physical distancing in the, mig in the migrant uh, dormitories there. It, it's much more complex in certain other situations. Uh, people in, in, very often in mental health institutions have significant other needs and they need to have that care and support. So you can't just uh, leave people without that support. Um, and uh, I think... Uh, there not only are there significant mental health implications of the pandemic itself on individuals, but there are people who have significant mental health problems who need constant support. And uh, it's a very complex issue. How do you reduce the chances of infection in these facilities while still being able to deliver adequate care? Um, but it also speaks, I think, in the long run to, to the whole concept of uh, large-scale institutionalization of people with mental health difficulties. Uh, I think we need to find uh, more sustainable f solutions for, for dealing with those in our society who suffer um, uh, mental health uh, illness um, and uh, uh, large mental health institutions in which people uh, are sometimes abandoned is, is, is not necessarily, not only from an epidemic point of view, not a good societal solution for dealing with those in our society who are unfortunate enough to deal with long-term mental health issues. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Next question is from uh, Swiss News, uh, Laurent Sierra. Uh, Laurent, please, if you hear us, go ahead. Uh, Laurent, you would Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. Question to Dr. Tedros. Uh, you briefed again the missions yesterday. I was wondering uh, whether the, the countries uh, which, uh, uh, whose leaders have been vocal in criticizing uh, WHO, like the US and Brazil, are still actively taking part to, to, to these briefings, or do you face boycotts, and, and what kind of engagement are you able to maintain with these countries? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. We are actually in constant uh, contact and uh, we, we work together. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, let's uh, try to go to uh, Morocco now. And it's a Morocco World News and we have a Christian uh, Janaris. Kristen, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes, we can hear you too. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, my question is regarding the WHO and EIB um, support for, you had mentioned, 10 African countries. I'm curious as to which countries will be supported by this partnership and what the selection criteria um, is for them. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have Mr. Hoyer on online? Maybe Mr. Hoyer would like to, I'm, to start. I, I'm in. But uh, I, I must disappoint you because uh, this communication has not gone to the respective governments yet. And therefore, I, I, for the time being, I cannot respond to this. And together with the WHO, we will do that within the next couple of days. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Hoyer for this. Uh, let me just see who do we still have online. Let's uh, take uh, Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie, if you hear us, please unmute yourself. Are we good? Jamie, yes. can, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, now it's okay. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, um, thank you very much um, for taking my question. Um, I have I want to I have just a quick question for for Dr. Tedros and then a follow up to Dr. Husson. Um, does WHO believe that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this corona, coronavirus? And what are you doing to try to find out if it was? Um, that's Thank you, me, Jamie. And, and just a quick follow up for Dr. Husson because um, there was a very interesting question from National Geographic earlier, and I just wanted to make sure that we followed up on that. President Trump, uh, Dr. Hussain, um, you mentioned um, um, lucidité a posteriori, um, which is, could be translated as hindsight is 2020, I think. Um, President Trump has been very severe with WHO and yesterday called it a public relations agency for China. How much should the emergency committee also be taking some of the, the, the heat from President Trump for not having stepped up earlier, and can you tell us if any, which of your members spoke out against declaring a fake on twenty uh, second, twenty third of January? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. We said one question per per journalist. Thank you. I was a follow up. Professor Usan, do you want to? Well, um, again, uh, I I must say that. I am not entitled to disclose the discussions which occurred during the emergency committee because there is a confidentiality agreement which was signed. So I shall not say what was the position of each of the, of the members. During the press conference on the 22nd and 23rd, I said that the committee was divided 50-50 and, the, the, and that there was a need 
to find a consensus to provide an advice to the DG. And at that time, the consensus was that it was a bit too early to declare a fake because there were four cases abroad and that it could be re-examined, of course, following a few days. Nevertheless, as say Dr. Tedros, recommendations were made which were allowing to uh, start all the measures that would uh, be necessary to implement in such a, a, such a situation. So this is the only thing I, I can say uh, on this matter. Uh, for the political aspect, I think uh, Dr. Tedros is perhaps better placed than me to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I couldn't take... Uh, uh, Welcome, Jamie. Uh, first of all, conferences aren't the same without you, so thank you for your question. Um, the, uh, with regard to the, the origins of the virus uh, in, uh, in Wuhan, uh, we have listened uh, again and again to numerous scientists who have looked at the sequences, looked at this virus, uh, and we are assured that this virus is natural in origin. And uh, what is important is that we establish uh, what that uh, natural host for this virus is. Um, and and, 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 the, and the, the primary purpose of doing that is to ensure that we understand uh, the virus more. We understand the animal-human um, interface uh, and we understand how the animal-human species barrier was breached. And the purpose of understanding that is that we can put in place the necessary prevention and public health measures to prevent that happening again uh, anywhere. Um, and that's, uh, that, that is uh, what uh, we are pursuing that and, and working uh, and offering uh, support to authorities to uh, carry out such um, such studies that will allow us to determine those very important um, um, outcomes, which will help us uh, uh, determine what the right steps are to ensure that this does not uh, happen again. Thank you very much. Next question is uh, Xinhua News Agency, uh, Mr. Wang, if I'm not wrong. Uh, we will try to get can the can can to Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking my question. The question is for Dr. Tedros. Uh, in Wuhan, the central China city was hardest hit by the epidemic. The number of COVID-19 patients in serious conditions has dropped to zero on last Friday. So what is WHO's comment on the response efforts in Wuhan? Thank you. I, I can I can I can start. Um, I mean that's very very welcomed news um, to hear that there are no more uh, severe cases, uh, no more patients in uh, in Wuhan. Um, China has worked very hard to bring the outbreak under control. Um, we I, I was there for two weeks and working directly with um, ministry officials and officials from all different sectors, uh, from hospitals, um, through communities, to really see what was put in place to bring those numbers down. Um, and we have learned, the world has learned from China, as it has from all countries that are dealing with COVID-19. Um, and, and it is welcomed news uh, to hear that there are no severe cases in Wuhan. Um, that city um, really has has had the hardest hit um, early on. There are a number of cities that are dealing with this now, and we need to continue to learn from Wuhan and how they are lifting those measures, how they were, are bringing society back to, to normal, or a new normal, uh, in terms of how we are going to live with this virus going forward. Uh, but we welcome all actions by all countries um, that are putting in place measures to suppress transmission. Um, to identify patients early so that those early patients don't progress to severe disease. Uh, we welcome the innovation and the treatments that are in clinical trials right now that are looking so hard to find treatments to prevent people from dying from COVID-19. Um, we welcome all and we thank the healthcare workers who have put themselves on the front lines to care for patients, to be away from their own families to care for patients, um, to prevent those individuals who are infected with COVID-19 from dying. So um, nothing but admiration um, and thanks um, for the tireless efforts of the people of Wuhan, not just the healthcare workers, but the individuals who, who stayed in their homes, 
um, who adhere to the public health measures for extended periods of time. Um, we take our hats off to you, um, and we thank you for your commitment and your service and for sharing uh, with us and the world what, what you've been able to do. So congratulations uh, to Wuhan on, on, on this, this achievement. And we know that you will remain vigilant um, to find any additional cases that come, because this is far from over. Um, and we know that, um, and everyone uh, stands uh, at alert to find cases as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a time for one or two more questions. So uh, we will uh, try to go to Spain now. Uh, Cristina Masdiaria. Uh, Cristina, can you hear us? Hello, uh, we are trying to get Cristina from Hello? Spain. Yes. Yes. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for, for answering my question. I would like to ask Dr. Maria Van Herkove if she could understand where are we now in the evolution of the pandemic? Could, if you can, you, can help you repeat, us to please? have a portrait of the current situation in a world level. Thank you very much. So thank you for the question. That's a that's a difficult question um, in terms of where we are in this evolution. So we are um, clearly uh, many countries are are in the in the uh, difficult time right now in terms of dealing with this outbreak. Um, countries across Asia um, have had their first wave of infection, and many have have been able to suppress the virus, have been able to bring the virus under control. We are seeing some countries which have seen a resurgence, um, namely in outbreaks and, and clusters of cases, either in expat dormitories or in, in major cities. Um, and so we're learning from Asia. Uh, in Europe, we're seeing a stabilization um, in many countries. We're seeing a decline in others. Um, and so that is welcomed news, but many countries have imposed uh, very strict public health uh, and, and social measures, uh, or so-called lockdown measures, and are looking to ease those. So uh, we cautiously need to see how, with the lifting of those measures, how that will impact uh, the virus in terms of its ability to transmit further. Uh, we are seeing increases in a number of countries across the Americas, um, and we, we've covered a couple of those today already. Um, but there are many countries uh, which are seeing an increase, uh, which is a worrying trend. We're seeing a number of countries in the eastern Mediterranean region um, see a stabilization and a decline in, in their cases. And again, this is, this is welcome news in terms of their ability to suppress this virus. But again, they have also imposed a strict public health and social measures. So we need to watch with caution as those uh, increase. And the situation in Africa, there are a number of countries that are still seeing low numbers of cases. Um, and there are opportunities um, in Africa, in many countries across Africa, to be able to prevent um, the uh, ability of this virus to take off. Um, again, it's a complex picture across the globe of where we are. Um, I think it is very clear that we have a long way to go. Um, the early seroepidemiologic investigations that are being conducted are indicating to us that a large proportion of the population remains susceptible, which means that the virus has the opportunity to infect more people. So it's important that we remain, that all countries remain vigilant and keep in place their workforce to detect the virus, to detect people who have the virus and care for them appropriately, um, to isolate them to find and trace all contacts and quarantine those contacts, to ensure that the public is fully informed of the situation in each country and at the lowest administrative level, um, because it's important that the public go with us in this and really understand that we have a long way to go. Um, and so we, we, do, we do see encouraging trends, and I think we need, to, we need to celebrate those successes, but we need to remain humble and we need to remain vigilant um, because this virus uh, likes to uh, find the cracks and it will exploit those cracks and find every opportunity to take off if it can. So we must do everything that we can to prevent that from happening. Can I just, uh, just supplement something? Marie's given an excellent overview. I just want to highlight uh, one particular situation that we become increasingly concerned 
with, and that is the, the, the rising number of cases in, in countries affected by fragility, conflict, and with high numbers of vulnerable populations, uh, refugees or displaced populations. Over the last week, a number of weeks, we've seen worrying increases of disease in Haiti, in Somalia, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, uh, in Sierra Leone, in the Central African Republic, and uh, most recently investigating a, a serious cluster of uh, respiratory disease in adults in Kano in, in northern Nigeria. Uh, we are, remain deeply concerned about the impact that this disease will have in communities who are already greatly underserved, have many underlying conditions, uh, and uh, um, it's, a, it's, it's a real concern for the humanitarian community. Uh, and I know Mark Lowcock, uh, um, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the Director General, uh, launched a humanitarian appeal a number of weeks ago now. But uh, there's still a lot of work to do in countries. We need to get uh, sustainable access to all populations in all countries, um, and we need to be able to deliver essential health services as well as COVID response. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's, 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 it's truly important that, uh, that, that this happens because these populations have already suffered too much. Uh, and the extra impact of COVID-19 uh, at this point can be avoided if we rush to provide the extra support that's needed um, uh, for these people who live on all sides of conflict. And as the Secretary General has called for on a number of occasions, we need a de-escalation of conflict in these situations in order for a proper uh, COVID-19 response to be mounted. No one on this planet will be safe until everyone is safe, and we cannot let this disease spread unchecked in these communities. Uh, it is, it is neither the right thing to do, nor is it the smart thing to do. And maybe we take last question before we finish here. Uh, Catherine Fiancan from uh, France 24. Catherine? Yes, um, do you hear me? Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. I would like to come back on the lifting of the lockdowns because, as you know, um, on May 11, the countries that have been the most hit uh, by the coronavirus in Europe and in the United States are uh, allowing kids to go back to school and uh, some people to open the restaurants uh, back. So I would like to see with you to remain us... Uh, um, what you know about the children, because in order to um, for parents not to be nervous, people say that children cannot be uh, affected, that they cannot transmit uh, the COVID. So could you please um, tell us what is exactly um, the knowledge, what you know about the virus for the moment, and also how long does the virus stays alive, stay alive on a surface? Do you have an ID? Do you have a precise ID for the moment? Thank you so much to you. So thank you for the question. This is, is, is an important question. Um, as you know, we are learning more about this virus every day, um, and we are all concerned about the impact of this virus on children. Um, what we know from, from data from all countries that we are receiving data from is that children appear to be less infected, affected, and, and developing disease. And that means when you look at the number of cases that are reported from, from all countries, um, a very small proportion of those are children, ranging between 1% and upwards of 5% are among children up to the age of 18, in some countries 19. So it's a small proportion of the total number of cases detected. Um, among those children who are identified as having COVID-19, the vast majority of them develop mild disease and recover. Um, and that is very important. Um, we are trying to understand why that is, and there are studies that are underway to better help us understand that. Um, there are some children, um, some who have had underlying conditions, others who have not, um, who have developed severe disease, who have had critical disease, and some children have died. So we cannot say universally that it's a mild disease in children. 
but the vast majority of children who have been identified as having COVID-19 have mild disease. Um, you heard of a report the other day of, of an inflammatory disease in some children that was identified in the UK. Now that is significant in the sense that we have astute clinicians and nurses and healthcare professionals who are looking at how this infection is, is impacting the body and they picked up a signal. This may be a, a real signal having to do with COVID-19 or it actually may not have to do with COVID-19 at all. What we've done within our clinical network, which is our global clinical network, is raise the alert and say, please look out for this. And we thank our colleagues in the UK for raising this so that we can better understand if this is something that is actually related to COVID-19. Um, so just to summarize on the disease, the overwhelming majority of children who, that, who are detected have mild disease and that's important. Um, with regards to transmission, um, there are, children are susceptible to infection, which means that they can get infected. Um, and from the studies that have been conducted, which are well-designed studies in households, for example, they've looked at um, if adults are transmitting to children or if children are transmitting to adults. And in most of those studies, it's adults transmitting to children. But there have been some instances where children, it, they're suspected that the children infected the adults. So it can go both ways. Um, again, we need more information to better understand this. Um, but children do remain susceptible uh, and they can get infected with this virus. Um, but they do tend to have mild disease. Thank you very much. Uh, we will conclude. Uh uh, today's press briefing. I will just ask uh, Professor Usain and Mr. Hoyer if they would like to add something uh, at the end. Maybe we start with uh, Professor Usain. Very much. Uh, I have nothing to, to add. I think everything was said. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation, Professor Usain. Uh, Mr. Hoyer, would you like to have some final words? That we are going to start. Uh, we didn't hear you. Can you just repeat, please? You were on mute. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Can you just please try one more time because we couldn't hear? Unmute yourself, please. Something seems okay. to be wrong with the unmuting here. Now it's okay. Better now. Now it's okay. Okay. So just thank you very much for for the opportunity, and let's uh, start a great cooperation. Thank you. Good luck for your work. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Usang, and also uh, my friend um, uh, Warner. Uh, and I would like to thank all who have uh, joined. And I would like to wish everybody happy Labor Day. Uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, this too will pass, and the antidote is solidarity. Let's stay together. Thank you so much. And see you on Monday. And we will have an audio file available very shortly and transcript hopefully tomorrow. Have a nice weekend and happy Labor Day.